Hey everyone, and welcome to All Tech is Human. Today we're talking about fighting misinformation while promoting free expression, and frankly, why that can be a delicate balance. I'm really excited today to have two experts. Uh, we have Claire Zhao and also Nora Benavides. So, uh, Clara and Nora, welcome. Thanks, David. It's great to be here. Yeah, thank you for having me. Well, I'm thrilled to have both of you. So actually, give us a little context for our discussion. I'd love for both of you to, to kind of just give us uh, a little bit of your background. So Claire, we'll, we'll, we'll start with you. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I started off my career in the private sector and was at Microsoft for several years, uh, where I first touched this issue uh, while I was working on a partnership project we were funding um, in Myanmar to look at election integrity there in the lead up to the first democratic election after years of military regime and really saw the offline consequences of uh, what lack of moderation can really do in an offline world. Um, I remember waking up at that time and thinking, this is gonna be probably the biggest issue that governments and society is gonna face. Um, and it probably won't be reactionary until it hits a Western democracy. That's typically how, how these issues work. Um, years later, I joined US government and was the CTO of two teams um, focused on online safety issues, one on terrorist content uh, online, and the second specifically on foreign influence operations, election security, and uh, broader disinformation responses across US government. So. Um, that's a little bit about me. Um, over the last year, uh, I was with Mozilla, um, really looking at content policies across different platforms and also uh, tools and techniques to actually uh, combat this from the platform side. Um, I've also been building a uh, 501c6 professional association for trust and safety teams at companies uh, who deal with what is considered um, authentic versus not behavior on platforms uh, to be able to be uh, better prepared for these challenges. Good. Well, I wrote down, uh, I've got my notepad here. I wrote down some notes with that. So uh, that's also something I want to encourage everybody watching. Uh, there's a comment section, whether you are watching this on Periscope or YouTube, please enter your comments here and we're going to, uh, to deal with those. So Nora, tell us a little bit about some of the work that you do with Latin America. Sure. Well, it's great to be here, um, David and yeah. Clara. Um, I want to make sure everyone can hear me. I um, I have to say it's such surreal times, but this feels like of all topics I've been uh, talking about over the last few weeks, the most urgent and important one. Um, you know, at PEN America, I run our U.S. free expression programs, and I came to the work um, having been a constitutional law and First Amendment litigator. And so I, I feel like I always think about, you know, how can we right wrongs? Um, and at PEN America, our free expression programs really try to monitor threats to speech and expression in a range of ways, whether it is online or offline. And um, I, you know, when we started monitoring disinformation, we actually started calling it uh, fake news or fraudulent news. And it was so interesting. It was really a sign of the times because it was, um, it was sort of pre-2017 um, as an organization concerned about how words might be weaponized or used to further very specific political and personal gains we were always worried and sensitive to that kind of phenomenon and that it really happens in authoritarian contexts, especially. And so we started looking at what was going on in the United States, frankly, um, leading up to the 2016 election. And once Trump became president, at least in the United States, we started looking at sort of his relationship to truth, you know, how there was this distancing from truth and what that does to society. And at the core of it, I think that what it does is it erodes our trust in institutions, it erodes our trust in, um, in each other, frankly. And we didn't have a very good grasp, you know, way back in 2016 and 2017 on in the United States, like to build on what Clara said, it absolutely has to come home and, you know, be something prevalent here for people to then suddenly, I think, wake up in some ways to this as a phenomenon. And, you know, the it, we were still kind of grasping at what was happening. And so um, what we did was started examining in our research reports the effect of disinformation on elections. And we started with the 2016 election, and then we revisited this um, in a 2019 report looking at the 2018 midterm election. And, you know, I feel like there are so many ways that this issue is kind of thorny from a free expression perspective. You know, a lot of people are quick to say, 
Well, the solution is easy. Let's crack down and try to censor or remove misinformation, disinformation online. And I assume we'll get into the distinctions between the different types of content. Um, and as a free expression organization, what we're always sensitive to is, well, what are the unintended consequences of dealing with speech in ways where we would automatically just remove it or get rid of it? Because honestly, I think that that can either quickly or over time lead to silencing and, and the censorship of certain views. And so one of our core areas of work now is trying to find solutions that will complement and not get in the way of people's speech. And so we've, uh, this year, and David knows about this, is we just launched a media literacy program to work with communities around the United States, mainly on um, how to increase their ability to understand what they're seeing, just information, news, whatever kind of content. We thought about doing this in the election context. And to be really honest, you know, COVID-19 hit, and I just felt like there was this moment to seize on talking about it in that context, because as we all know, there's been this deluge of in information, whether it's news, punditry, otherwise. And so part of our work is really helping people sift through what they're seeing. Um, and my goal is always to make people feel empowered so that what they do is begin understanding how the news gets made, um, to try to, you know, kind of begin to break down the distrust that we're seeing that I believe ultimately contributes to polarization. Okay. Well, let's, uh, let's deal with that issue since that's obviously top of mind, something we wanted to discuss with COVID-19. It seems to really heighten at that tension, Nora, that you're talking about and, and Clara, that you, you deal with, right? Because on one hand, we want to encourage free expression. If you think about the very founding of the web and the principles, if you think about uh, I think this is the cyberspace manifesto saying that hey, the cyberspace is something that is not going to be touched by uh, by our laws. But now you have an issue where speech could potentially, uh, if it's uh, misinformation around treatment, uh, you know, telling mm -hmm. somebody is something that would not actually be a uh, legitimate cure could could lead to to chaos. So how do you think how do you think we can go about striking this this balance? Because Again, uh, right now is a time where we, we have a lot of heated emotions uh, and, and we have a lot of, of need to, uh, to, to have a vibrant yet, yet safe kind of information ecosystem, if you will. Mm -hmm. So Clara, Nora, what, what would you say to something like that? Nora, do you want to kick it off? I'll, I'll jump in after you. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, uh, this is the crux of the discussion. Nora, you can do it. Um, <laughs> well, you know, I guess, in the COVID-19 context, I think there's something interesting, uh, basically in distinguishing the types of content we're seeing for the, like from the outset, because much of what I started witnessing um, at a very ad hoc level a couple of weeks ago is that people were just digesting, internalizing, and then beginning to kind of implement in their practices things that people were sharing at an extremely informal uh, pundit level. You know, anyone who is a publisher in many ways on Twitter who can post their opinion, I think there was just sort of this flood of people wanting to speak out. And one of the things that uh, we're doing at PEN America is trying to unpack for people, you know, what are some of the really, really easy first steps you can take in beginning to understand what information is? Because frankly, um, you know, it's, it's easy to go to the CDC website. It's easy to go to the World Health Organization website. I think there are then going to be more insidious questions, frankly, that we're going to have to face around what happens when we see scientists or other officials being silenced or being targeted and told that they cannot speak to the media. What happens when we have a president that himself uses the press to position which people are in the room covering press briefings about the coronavirus task force? You know, I think those are questions that actually will lead to the way content gets manipulated and treated for the public. And in the middle of all of it, you know, I don't want to always have to tell people just become more critical. I think that's such a sort of sad state to have to be in. And I don't know, Clara, if there are other things that you guys are working on and what you've seen in some of this, because much of what we're trying to do is just empower people to begin learning how to verify what they're looking at and then to honestly think about things before they share because it, we do not want to contribute to the deluge of false or misleading information. Yeah, um, I'm happy to jump in here. So the way that um, the way that I've been looking at misinformation during COVID is um, really under uh, three 
three types of behavior. Um, the first is who is this actor that might be pushing this information. Uh, the second is uh, specifically what is the behavior they're doing? Are they doing a bot campaign? Is it being manipulated by particular accounts that may or may not uh, necessarily have uh, the right intention? And then three, what is the context of the content, right? So um, today, if I were to spread the news that Nora, you are dating celebrity X, it doesn't cause harm on anyone. But today, if I were to tell you, hey, Nora, you, you can actually, did you know that you can actually um, be immune to coronavirus if you drink bleach? Uh, that might actually have uh, legitimate consequences. And those are both misinformation. There's nothing on platforms today that say that's illegal speech to participate in. But one one method of communicating a message has a lot of consequences today, especially for people that are searching for information. They can go online, they can put in the keyword, can coronavirus drink bleach? And if the first few top results are ones where people are affirming that worldview, a lot of people might actually go and do it. Um, so I think those are the dangers um, today that is especially dangerous. We're seeing more and more screen time for people <laughs> right now in quarantine. Um, we're also seeing specifically um, a lot of other types of um, inauthentic behavior like price gouging on masks, which a lot of companies have acted on recently. Um, there's people that uh, claim that they have uh, coronavirus test kits, right? So there's all kinds of uh, disinformation, misinformation across the board, uh, which gets me back to really first defining the differences between disinformation and misinformation. So uh, misinformation um, really is uh, misleading information. It could be, it could cause harm, it, it may not. Um, but disinformation specifically is when there is an actor behind it that is intentionally trying to push a worldview. Um, so there might be an agenda that's set um, and the intent behind the content is to disinform. So I wanted to first start off with that to make sure uh, everyone else listening has a good sense of the two differences. Um, and then there's also malinformation and malinformation um, can, can mean information that specifically um, is out there and causes harm, but unintentionally. So today, if I were to share a article and that news article were to have a, thick, a picture of an explosion that I'm claiming, claiming happened today, but actually is a recycled photo, um, that may cause harm in people necessarily thinking uh, this is recent news, uh, but it was uh, not necessarily uh, intentional to be shared. It might be a news outlet accidentally receiving uh, the wrong photo um, or using something that they, they thought was real time. So I think um, maybe the next part we're going to get into, and, and please tell me if, if you can uh, hear me a little better now. I guess there was some issue with uh, with my microphone. But I think the, the next question we want to get to is, um, what do you think the social media platforms should be doing? How can they strike that, that balance between free expression and also trying to limit this misinformation? Clara, you want to jump in? Yeah, um, I'm happy to, to start. Um, I think companies today um, are playing this incredibly powerful role in dictating what is what is considered uh, what is considered behavior they want to accept on their platforms and which ones are not. What's been in very interesting to see during coronavirus is a lot of the companies that are larger that use at scale uh, reviewers, um, at scale vendors, they actually uh, are no longer able to use those because of privacy issues. A lot of these vendors uh, work in settings in which they have to protect user privacy. Uh, and so right now the hands of moderation is actually fallen on full-time employees at companies to do this. So, you know, there's an increase in, especially the larger companies using automated takedown and automated detection um, of a lot of content, which, you know, is, 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 is very interesting and definitely gets into the question of um, how do we moderate free speech at scale if there are always going to be certain things that uh, don't have the best intention that might violate policies in between. So um, that automated detection and machine learning side is definitely something that, uh, is is very very interesting, um, especially in this time. Well, I think that's something we'll have to kind of clarify too, and maybe have some some good discussion about. Is it seems like a lot of people gravitate towards the First Amendment when they're talking about uh, speech on social media platforms, especially since we tend to 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 say, "Hey, Twitter is the modern public square," and, and other analogies like that. Mm -hmm. But from a technical standpoint, 
uh, the First Amendment wouldn't apply in the same way that it would apply in the uh, in the public square. So, so I'd love one of you to to maybe talk a little bit more about that and, and where you think this issue should go, because it seems like we want the spirit of the First Amendment to apply. But uh, as it stands right now in 2020, uh, it wouldn't it wouldn't apply uh, perfectly. It seems like we have a First Amendment right to access social media, but we also give social media platforms the ability to uh, to moderate their content as long as they are considered a, uh, a neutral uh, arbiter, I mm -hmm. guess, of, the, of that content. Well, one of the questions that I think is really interesting is it, right now playing out, you know, how much control and power do we want to give those arbiters that are opening up space for speech? You know, and I'll give you a few examples of, of how this is playing out. I think that a lot of us right now, leaders, um, you know, platform executives, even the public, we're, we're attentive to the kind of balance between keeping people safe right now and trying to implement things that might actually end up infringing or beginning to think about encroaching on our civil rights and civil liberties, as well as our First Amendment rights. You know, in the middle of COVID-19, I think the platforms have honestly had this resurgence of respect in many ways because they've been so quick to remove false information. Much of it is the information um, that, you know, would encourage people to take actions that actually could put them or their friends or, you know, their followers at risk. Um, you know, whether it's that drinking bleach will cure you if you have coronavirus in your mouth or gargling with saline. Um, you know, a lot of these- We are will not, we should be clear. We should have <laughs> that out, yeah. right? And that's an important part to mention, though, right? And and maybe yeah. something we get at is that the idea of having a, a truth sandwich and, and being able to uh, easily kind of uh, debunk uh, misinformation. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, right now, I, I feel like there's sort of this emotional, there's heightened emotional state where we're like, yes, we want the platforms to be taking sort of control and trying to remove that type of dangerous content because right now it feels so dangerous. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, let's see, with... Google, for example, you know, they established this 24 hour incident response team that removes misinformation from search results. Facebook, uh, in their WhatsApp platform, they teamed up with the World Health Organization to provide a messaging service that offers real time updates. A lot of that feels intuitively right. You know, it's keeping us safe. It's um, really targeting very specific misinformation or disinformation. And it sometimes varies and sometimes it's unclear what the information really is, if there's been some kind of um, mal intent there. The problem in my opinion is then when we think about this in the political context, because frankly, it's much harder um, to think through what we should be establishing for the policies that the platforms implement. You know, um, a lot of what we felt might seem obviously removable, like the drinking bleach will save you, um, it's a little harder when something is political ads that feature misleading information or videos that have been spliced together but have a kernel of truth in them. And I feel like those standards are in truth, the sort of accuracy in politics is much more subjective, which means when it comes to questions around how the platform should be engaging in content moderation, the questions become very loaded. And, you know, we absolutely, all of us as sort of users have a right of access. And that's been affirmed by the US Supreme Court um, a couple of years ago in a case which um, really affirmed that we all have the ability and the right, a First Amendment right to access and be on platforms. But then there are these other just questions of how do you reduce harm? And, um, and those are things that frankly, I, I think we're just not quite ready to, at least on our end, at, as a free expression organization, you know, to hand over the, the reins completely to platforms. So I think we're going to also deal with some questions, if you don't mind, make this uh, highly interactive. We're going to have a bunch of good questions right now. First one we're going to deal with that you should see up on your screen uh, is talking about uh, the studies. Uh, what kind of studies do we have showing that this disinformation is uh, persuading people? Uh, what are the practical effects of fake news? Um, do we have studies that are measuring these effects? So what do we think? 
Yeah, um, I, you know, again, I think that comes mm -hmm. down to, I, I can jump in briefly here. Um, I don't have at scale studies, but specifically around different issues like terrorist content or foreign influence operations, there's been a lot of researchers that have looked at this and said, hey, um, how far did political advertisement go <laughs> in the 2016, 2018 elections to really persuade people who to vote in a way that they wouldn't otherwise. And unfortunately, it's very hard to uh, categorize what really causes someone to engage in behavior. But I think there's been a lot, a lot of evidence under different types of content uh, that there is the ability for uh, offline harm. Um, the other example is obviously radicalization, right? Encountering violent extremism online, a lot of groups are mobilized to violence by watching, um, you know, in the instance of ISIS, um, videos of Anwar al um giving sermons that are not beheadings, they are not violent content, but it does persuade someone to think about a worldview it, so much to the extent that they want to travel, buy a plane ticket and go to Syria to fight for ISIS. Um, so, um, you know, there's, there's obviously um, such a range of different types of behavior out there. Um, Nora, I don't know if you have any studies at scale uh, that, that talk about this more broadly. Well, yeah, I mean, the short answer is yes. And I think one of the, from the outset, one of the things that we work on in our trainings when we work with communities, because people always ask me this question, you know, they're like, well, what evidence is there? Um, you know, and I kind of start with, uh, frankly, a somewhat flippant response is that, you know, propaganda has always been sort of this um, aspect of false information or misleading information. And so there is a psychological effect and studies, um, numerous studies have been done on why we're so susceptible to mis and disinformation. Um, and really it's because no matter what, when we confront something, we, um, when confronted again with it, we'll often then feel like it is somehow more true. Um, Facebook did a study in 2016 actually about this, which is, it's called the illusory truth effect, for example. And it's really that, you know, if we're all confronted, let's say, as Facebook users with headlines and we're told which ones are true or false, and then we're distracted and we're shown more things, when we go back and are shown headlines that we already saw and were identified as true or false, no matter what, we view all of those as more true. And so over time, there's sort of this psychological effect of just internalizing the things we see which frankly, from a solution standpoint, creates a problem where it's like, well, how do we begin to help people, you know, unpack what they're seeing and help them disavow themselves of the view that something might be real or true if they've just seen it over and over. And so platforms are one of the ways that this, I think is just the most amazing breeding ground for that because we're all sharing information all the time. And it's one of the reasons we always say, put a pause on this, um, in terms of other studies, I don't have any that I can name, like the titles of those. Um, <laughs> I, I didn't know. Really I know, I did not either. Okay, Disinformation like, yeah. spreads faster. Uh, and, and I think it also, uh, there was a New York Times article today talking about the appeal of, of uh, misinformation, conspiracy theories, that it gives us a sense of control. And then having access to the truth, especially right now, if, we're, if we bring it back to COVID-19, uh, we're desperately seeking information. Uh, and, and that also puts us in a vulnerable position where to have truth, to, to say this can solve it, uh, seems to be very attractive. I want to bring up uh, this comment uh, from Jamie talking about social media's role, right? Uh, it says, that is a legitimate role for Facebook, not to add or take away fact, but to contextualize better uh, than a note that says, be careful about what this says. I, I want to bring that up because one of the issues that major social media platforms are getting into is, all right, let's say they spot something that could could arguably, arguably be misinformation. Uh, they have a few different options, right? You could take this down, you could flag it or, you know, create some type of banner, some type of notification, uh, or you could de-emphasize it, right? Limit its uh, ability, limit its reach. And that's the discussion we have around the difference between freedom of speech versus the freedom of reach. So what would you advise? What, what do you think uh, the role of social media companies should be right now? Should they be taking it down? Should they be flagging it? Because I know there's obviously been a lot of studies showing that flagging sometimes, like you said, Nora, kind of deepens the conspiracy um, uh, or should they just de-emphasize it? Well, you know, in the study that I just mentioned uh, that Facebook did actually in 2016, one of the things they found was that even the disclaimers that they would put up as sort of banners on content often didn't trigger any kind of skepticism for people to think twice about the veracity of the story um, or, you know, the content. And so, 
Um, intuitively, I often think that banners or uh, some kind of provisional notice for viewers is great in theory. Um, I think one of the questions ultimately though is what are the platforms really doing? Twitter yep. rolled out some really great or what it felt like were really interesting and um, provisionally probably useful guidelines around how they were going to treat synthetic content um, with you know, minimizing reach, um, you know, lowering the visibility of a lot of content if it's seen to be either synthetic and especially if it's synthetic and misleading or it's with the intent to mislead. I, honestly, I'm not sure it takes long, long longitudinal studies to be able to then track if Twitter is actually doing that. And I think one of the questions will be, you know, how, um, how effective is it? In terms of removing content, I would always uh, dissuade generally users and the public from thinking that removal of content is the answer. Because ultimately when you remove content, it doesn't just go away, it doesn't disappear, um, it, so, it goes somewhere else. And the question really is how do we um, create spaces that are safe, but also opportunities for people to engage in discourse? A lot of that was kind of the Alex Jones Infowars issue, right, where they found that by downplaying the virality of, of a lot of his information, it basically lowers the, the proverbial microphone. I think that's kind of the issue. We like to jokingly say, hey, everybody's got a, uh, you know, an amplifier, everybody in the public square, everybody has a microphone. But I think what uh, is little understood is that everybody's volume is dramatically different and typically based on uh, an algorithm that they wouldn't have access to. So Claire, it seemed like you had some some comments to add with that too. Yeah, no, um, I just I just wanted to add um, specifically, um, I think it's, it, Nora, I love how you brought up the work that you're doing right now in digital literacy, because I actually think there's also an, a discussion that's not often had around uh, different demographics that might be more susceptible to misinformation or disinformation than others. Uh, a lot of people today sometimes can't tell the difference between an advertisement and what is, organic content, right? And for those users, it might be more effective to have a label that's more obvious. Um, whereas, you know, Gen Z today and millennials may actually already know, they know what is an advertisement when they see it. Uh, they know what is considered spam uh, or a scam that they see in their inbox. Um, a lot of people without uh, adequate digital literacy uh, are the ones that end up sharing a lot of the fake news, even if the label's there. Um, I think the other point is also around context for labels. So um, in the 2000 and um, in the lead up to the 2018 midterm elections, Facebook started to roll out uh, more labels on the source of where the advertising was coming from. And I recall looking at one advertisement coming from Macedonia. And um, most people don't know why they should care about Macedonia mm -hmm. um, if, if they, they're not in the disinformation space. Uh, but that was a source of a lot of um, political advertisement um, that uh, was, was meant to um, actually uh, dissuade um, people to vote a certain way. And so, um, that that is those are examples. Even if something is correctly labeled, uh, oftentimes um, without the necessary education and background of of why it's being labeled that way, um, it's 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 not as effective. Um, I do think that some labeling is better than no labeling, um, which brings me back to the earlier point around where are the boundaries of free expression? Right, labeling is a way to allow for more free expression while keeping content up, um, even limiting reach um, and the way that content can be shared in surfaces are ways that certain platforms still want to allow for free expression, um, but want to limit the types of um, uh, people that might accidentally stumble upon it without the necessary context. Um, I think there's the other interesting debate that hasn't been had uh, is specifically around the intersection of moderation and privacy. The better you want to be able to have context to moderate content to determine, is this a bad actor? <laughs> is mm -hmm. this um, backed by you know, an, another country? Um, is this something uh, that is a joke that someone's goofing around with? To have that context, you're also asking platforms to be able to look into users' privacy more and more. And so a lot of times, uh, people who ask for stronger privacy standards um, oftentimes forget uh, there might be other things that you're losing out on um, as, as you're making that request. So, All right. Well, we have a comment on that that frankly gets right into uh, Nora, uh, some, of, some of the area that, that I imagine you focus on uh, with Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act of 1996, with which uh, generally grants a certain level of immunity if the platform is uh, is acting in a neutral capacity. So, so where would you take that? Uh, it kind of seems like there is a 
tension uh, because on one hand, we're telling social media companies uh, or pushing them in a direction to act more like a media company that has editorial control. If you're the Wall Street Journal, let's say, for example, you can control exactly what's in your, your news. Uh, but that also opens you up to, to a lot more kind of uh, legal uh, aspects. So, so Nora, could you, could you uh, tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, you know, right now there's a legislative conversation at the federal level, and there's been percolating, bubbling up to the top, I think, conversations around the issue of intermediary liability and uh, platform liability more largely for the last few years. You know, as we are seeing platforms be used for distribution of content in, in mass that is leading to what seem to be detrimental effects to society, elections, general just... Um, feelings of unease about the way content actually gets distributed. The question has been, how can leaders then put pressure on platforms somehow to be accountable for what they're doing and their role in promoting or even just being a vehicle for speech? Um, you know, when Section 230 was created, um, and I mentioned this to David in passing, you know, it was such a different internet. Like, honestly, just for a minute, we, sh we need to think well back before Facebook and, and even before Google, I, I might add. I mean, before all of that, it was a time when I think we were all I don't want to say all of us, but so many of us were excited about truly the opportunity to use our voice and amplify it online, you know, to have our own website to the three of us, you know, could say, wow, we really want to pursue this topic on misinformation and free expression back in uh, 2001, let's say. And so, oh, why don't we get together and create a website and just start doing content, writing things, whatever. The, the kind of visceral reaction of excitement, you know, that we would be able to somehow then be able to do that and that internet service providers would not be liable for whatever content we put up there seemed somehow, it felt right in many ways. It felt like what we were doing was actually promoting speech and we were promoting um, a kind of egalitarian, like even playing field for people who were online users. Um, the internet has changed and the platforms that have now bubbled up and have become the leading um, sort of gateways for the way we engage in information and consumption of articles, ideas, whatever, you know, it's obviously now created the question of, well, should they be liable? Should we be holding Facebook liable for what a third party person says? So to be clear, if we're on Facebook and I talk, uh, you know, say horrible things about David, should <laughs> Facebook be liable for what Please I say? Please don't. Just stop throw that in there. <laughs> I'll say nice things afterwards, so yeah. we'll offset it. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Appreciate that. Um, I you know, wins. Well, the, and the question, because I think a lot of times people don't understand what Section 230 actually is and, and why it was so fascinating to watch the arc change when we started with Section 230, and it was so fantastic in many ways and now feels problematic. You know, should Facebook be liable for what I'm saying or the harm that I am causing to David? And essentially it says no, um, and that service providers as well should not be liable for third party content that they post or feature on their sites. You know, I think the question now is leaders are obviously saying that has to change. And there, my sense is that we need to very, very carefully draft what the boundaries would be of liability. Um, we're moving in that direction anyway, but I, I don't see that happening frankly. And the wheel, the sort of like political wheels moving very quickly. Claire, I don't know if on the tech side, you know, you have other ideas or thoughts. Yeah, um, I, you know, it, it's funny because, you know, as a technologist that decided to go and spend time working in government, I think there is a lot of policies today that are written that companies don't even know how to adopt. And so Section 230, I think, is, is one of these weird areas where as technology accelerates and the landscape of the Internet changes, um, it, it, you're looking, like you mentioned, a very different Internet. Um, and I think a lot of policymakers today don't quite understand the nuances of Section 230 um, in order to make um, objective and qualified policies around it. Um, I think it's really interesting. The U.S. has actually, you know, been um, quite um, quite settled in not necessarily taking any immediate uh, policy action. There's been a lot of leadership on the EU side, um, really looking at what is possible, um, but. Uh, it, you know, I, I think it's um, I think it's it's very misunderstood. And I think, you know, around all types of policies that companies are acted are, are asked to um, enforce against, we can use child pornography as an example. 
there's also this broader question, the more that a company reports, uh, the more they look bad, <laughs> you know, the more that they're trying to be transparent, it could be like, we're now doing better detection models for child pornography. Um, but with that, um, they might be the only company that's out there reporting that they have terrible content and the headline suddenly becomes, uh, you know, company X is rampant with, with child pornography content. So um, I, I think I think there is a lot of um, a lot of questions around how we can design better policies uh, to fix certain issues that we find problematic. But it's really uh, getting specific on what exactly that is. You know, we're able to do that for child pornography. It it costs a lot of companies to really care about an issue, um, but a lot for for the black and white, which is why it's so different and difficult with misinformation. Um, it's it's often very hard to figure out where that boundary is drawn and everyone will have their own opinion on where that line uh, really breaks breaks the rules. Well, you know? I, I think that's why I wanna bring up, or, or Nora, I think you might have something to add in there, but I'll just kind of add a, a, a little bit with this question. Since we're talking about it uh, and we're all Americans, right? We're talking about it from our own uh, feelings about the First Amendment rights, uh, which obviously would be dramatically different than let's say Germany, right? We, we have, uh, Lots of lots of great That's examples okay. about right right about how a lot of other countries would would value uh, value this this balance between uh, personal kind of civil liberties and um, and you know potential potential violence. So I'm curious since these companies like Facebook uh, and, and Twitter and others uh, since they are global in nature, uh, how do you think we can solve that? Since since these content moderation teams. Uh, are are going to be across the world? Well, I'll, I'll say one thing because it sort of actually was a segue. I had this thought um, responding to Clara before the question, and I, you know, it was so funny. Recently, I went to a conference on disinformation in Thailand, and I was one of the only Americans. And one of the comments it was um, with the U.S. Embassy and other. Um, you know, tech leaders. And one of the comments I got was people said, you are so hopeful, so American in the way you think about our rights and that they should be guaranteed and that we can protect them and talk about them. And I actually think a lot of the policies that the platforms are at least beginning to think through, or even the ones that they've already released also have a kind of kernel that feel very American in many ways, because they're linked to those principles, even if they don't actually follow through on protecting them. Um, what's been interesting and in what I'm very concerned about is in the absence of accountability for platforms or otherwise, I'm seeing governments take into their own hands the issue of disinformation to create statutes, especially criminal laws that will target people who promote false information online. You know, Section 230 was really in many ways, not just um, an answer to our issues around disinformation. We have to think about that th it encompasses so much more. And at least in this unique space around misinformation and disinformation, countries are now beginning to use these new laws to target certain people. And it feels like perhaps it, those would be fantastic at, at first blush, you know, that a law that would criminalize those purveyors of disinformation uh, would be good. You know, let's let's use those. The problem is that often their implementation and application is extremely uneven, and often they are used as vehicles to target dissent, um, as well as press and journalists. And so, you know, in the global context, I feel like there is this new and kind of, I, I think we're not going to see an end to it. I think it's actually the beginning of an uptick in governments asserting what seems to be control out of concern for what this misleading type of content does to communities and under the auspices of that are actually cracking down on speech that might otherwise be critical or you know just social commentary something like that well this is yeah. where i am oh, sorry go, oh, go no. ahead yeah, on the international side, I wanted to add, I think, you know, with Germany, Natsichi was a, you know, was a law that was passed, um, you know, a few years ago. Um, it, I think policymakers that have uh, created, uh, created strong reactions to, to content have also seen how difficult this job is, right? Um, I think it's really hard for a lot of people that don't work in the technology side to actually see, hey, if we were to implement this process, how would this actually work? while allowing for freedom of speech. Um, and so in Germany, a lot of policymakers saw themselves being censored. Um, so I think it's really, really tricky uh, in terms of how we go about it. What are the actual concrete solutions? 
Um, I think I will add to that, that I think it's so important, uh, just like every single uh, other type of career and workforce, for people that work in trust and safety and content moderation to have diversity. If you don't have diversity in language, diversity in thought, thought um, keep, and you are the one deciding to write the policies or write the rules, um, if you are a diplomat in US government today, you can go to another country, but you're requested to learn the language, to understand what the customs and norms are. Um, and a lot of times people who accidentally fall into roles in trust and safety at companies don't have that background. They don't have that training. They're asked to make a lot of major decisions that heads of states are made with limited information um, on how to do that aside from user reporting. And so I think that part is incredibly important. Um, how do we ensure that uh, there is uh, enough information and diversity in people that do moderation. How do we make sure that they have the right context? How do we make sure that a video they see that is violent is not something that um, is a war crime uh, that should be documented and should be used in international criminal courts? Um, so these kinds of uh, different issues uh, professionals today are expected to know um, are, are rampant, and um, you know a lot of um, a lot of where we can fix this comes into um, a better bridge between policymakers and and people critical at making these decisions. Well, I do you think that's uh, that's why we've seen kind of a movement with a lot of social media companies to really replicate a lot of what we've seen in the uh, governmental kind of uh, kind of kind of sphere. So, for example, um, Facebook has received a lot of attention for their quote unquote Supreme Court idea that Zuckerberg pushed. I believe last uh, April, and now it has evolved into uh, Facebook's oversight board. Um, myself, I, I uh, you know, I got appointed recently for TikTok's uh, new content advisory panel. So it seems like there is a, a movement right now to allow for that same level of kind of transparency that you might have in a, um, a governmental kind of kind of system. So wh where do you see this this issue headed? Do you, do you do you think these these major tech platforms are going to uh, continue to kind of replicate uh, what you would normally see with with how we we think about and regulate speech. Um, more and more companies, I mean, at least in the last two years, have pushed out what's known as transparency reports. And a lot of times, this is you know, for those that are not familiar, a way where they report how much hate speech took place um, for LinkedIn. You know, how many fake accounts uh, were on it. Um, and it's it's interesting because um, it's it has become more of an industry practice for most companies that they want to be transparent to push out something. Uh, I think the downside is there is lack of standardization of how that looks from platform to platform. So if you wanted to have a bird's eye view of what is the state of um, fake you know fake content across ten different platforms, you wouldn't be able to find a consistent answer today. Um, are we actually doing a better job in preventing really bad actors from from surfacing or not? Um, incredibly hard to measure. Um, Nor I, I don't know if you wanted to jump in on anything there on the transparency well, side. I, at least you know I think through um, how these platforms, especially like the Facebook <laughs> board, is uh, is beginning to sort of be structured like um, uh, an enforcement mechanism of some sort. You know, to review the most disturbing cases, if you will. My hope, I'm hopeful, I'm hopeful that the Oversight Board will um, be able to grapple and carefully draft policies that will actually lead to, you know, inclusive speech expression, that there is open discourse while at the same time removing dangerous content, um, or at least dealing with it appropriately. The concern I have is honestly the, the sheer logistics of all of this. And I feel like in the middle of all of it, there's something that we haven't quite talked about, which is just the like the numbers and the volume of all of this and how are we going to ever really escalate um, issues in the, the like micro examples of um, troubling, misleading information when there is so much of it. Um, I just think that the in thinking through how mis or disinformation gets created, distributed and then redistributed, it's that redistribution to me that is so uh, concerning. And when we think about something like Facebook and their oversight board, you know, they're going to be dealing with issues hopefully in real time. Well, by that point, I think honestly, content will have proliferated so quickly. I, I just do not know how it will be feasible um, to quickly and sort of responsively deal with these issues when they come up. In the disinformation context, it could potentially be null and void by the time the oversight board even sees a case. And, um, and this is honestly, in many ways, 
excluding the policy, the moral, the ethical, the free expression issues. It's really like the lawyer brain, you know, my lawyer had, I'm like, I just don't even know how they're going to be able to, um, you know, get the wheels turning fast enough on these cases sometimes. Well, I think that's why I want to bring up the issue, or, or Clara, go ahead. Um, I also wanted to bring up, I know this is uh, something that a lot of people don't really talk about, is there's now an entire business in people that create clickbait news. And yeah. this is their job, right? And so you also have to think about people who, if suddenly a major platform bans certain actors, they're losing out on their main source of income and they will continue to promote that content elsewhere. And perhaps in a less savory platform in which there is no moderation, but it you know fuels a community uh, that, that wants a little bit more um, freedom in whatever is expressed. So um, I, I think that's the other side is Facebook. I think you know it's great that they are they are creating um, and in the process of building up their um, observation board. But I do think that it's also important not to ignore other third party platforms where if I were to share something on Facebook, it gets removed. Um, there are tens of other sites that don't have moderation teams, don't have really good policies. And, um, you know, this is something, you know, the disinformation and misinformation on the Internet today is something that all companies need to stand together behind. You know, it's like, you know, when there's a financial cri crisis, Wall Street knows when to work together. Unfortunately, with companies, there's always been a history of um, we're going to be cagey about what we share with each other. Um, you know, our problem may not be other people's problems. Um, and and that, that unfortunately, is no longer the case. Um, if there is something that, for example, um, someone uh, uses one platform, um, gets gets very hurt on one, they may not return to another one. Um, so so I think those those kinds of realities are really important. And also looking at how do we also fix uh, people today that are influencers that might actually uh, continue to promote because they are economically incentivized to do so as well. And I think that's an area where a lot of people haven't necessarily talked about in this debate. And those actors will continue to exist because that's their main source of income now. Mm -hmm. Sure. And and to, to that point, though, there are doppelganger sites for all the major social media platforms. There tend to be like the there's Twitter, then there's a Gab, there's 4chan, then there's 8chan. There, there's ones that go to a more extreme, like if you can't make it on that platform or if you get kicked off. But I think that also gets to the point of whether there should be one uniform expectation on a national or potentially global level or whether there's going to be uh, a web of the future where there's so many different levels of toxic behavior. Like if, if you like this standard of Disney, you go here. If you like uh, <laughs> Cinemax, you go here, you know. Uh, so I think that's a larger question. But what I want to get to, uh, since a lot of this discussion really gets to media literacy, right? So on one hand, you have platforms responsibility. Uh, then you have kind of the education side. Uh, so kind of we have we have a question right now of saying, is there a relationship between countries that have strong media literacy programs uh, and countries that that don't? Do you see any kind of relationship uh, between the two about how they're able to deal with uh, misinformation? Um, you know, the the media literacy movement, if you will, is relatively, relatively new. There have been a few organizations in the United States that have been working on this for many years, about like the last decade, but it's only seen in the United States a sort of surge in the last couple. Um, in other countries, you know, there has been very little comparative research done on what actually happens, what the effect of media literacy skills are. Those are actually being done now, some of that research, um, which is really interesting to kind of stay tuned for actually, is looking at what the um, effect or success is around implementing media literacy training and curriculum uh, at a variety of levels. You know, in the United States, there's been um, a rather paltry legislative push um, but very meaningful that people should be aware of to um, by Senator Klobuchar, for example, to sponsor federal legislation to push for implementation across all states of media literacy curriculum in middle and high schools. Um, it hasn't gone very far, and I think it's really promising. At the state level, some of what we're looking into on our policy and advocacy work is where it might be feasible to do that type of work. Um, and frankly, you know, it's really hard to measure success. Um, what you're doing or what we're doing in, in implementing and, and giving people media literacy tools is trying to help them take control of the way they experience information online. And the only way we can really measure what that is, is based on their reporting, meaning the way they talk about what they're doing. 
Um, and so far, you know, there have not been studies in the United States of whether that's successful because it's so new. And um, it's really only one of the early steps that we're taking. And I mean, all of us in the media literacy expert space to help provide toolkits and resources for people to begin trying to think more critically about what they're engaging in online. Well, I do think there's something important to, to point out, though. Uh, a few months ago, Pew Research did come out uh, with, a, with a survey showing that it's actually older Americans that were more likely to share misinformation, uh, specifically on platforms like Facebook, which might indicate that the media literacy uh, education that, that a lot of American students are receiving could, could be beneficial in reducing this. And then to a question that we just popped up on screen, uh, I will say to that, uh, in the US, different than let's say in uh, England, uh, the education is done by state by state basis. And there has been a movement. Uh, Common Sense Media is one of the organizations behind a lot of this legislation that tends to package digital citizenship and media literacy in tandem. Uh, and there's been a lot of success uh, uh, in, in Utah, Washington uh, State and, and others on that. Um, but I, but it gets it gets to the bigger question of what happens in the in the countries that uh, would be less likely to, to have that uh, to have that training. So, for example, Facebook here, we're talking about it as if it's an American issue. Their biggest uh, their, their, their biggest level of users uh, derive from from India. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, oftentimes, uh, especially around some of the, the issues that have happened with WhatsApp, uh, these are in countries that have uh, a lot less uh, access to, to media literacy training. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I, I wanted to jump in on that. Um, my background, actually, before disinformation was in education. Um, and I think around around media literacy, the biggest challenge is who should be the one actually pushing it out. Right. So if the U.S. government today were to push out a major campaign for media literacy, um, a lot of people who may not like uh, the administration might actually not take it seriously and they think it might be propaganda. I think it's so hard to figure out who is that neutral source that can actually um, just give broad digital literacy training uh, to, to people. Um, I think second is I was going to bring up the 65 and older um, study that you just mentioned. Um, what are ways that we can reach um, older Americans and those that are more likely to share? There's also a lot of vulnerable groups that tend to just want to find um, those that agree with their worldview and are much more likely because of emotional reasons um, to share content they immediately see. Uh, that's independent of, of them actually um, knowing media literacy well or not. They just if you, they feel incentivized to do so. Um, so so I think it's, it's really interesting. I think it's really hard to also do media literacy without a lot of budget in marketing. Um, this is why certain brands are so effective. They just pile money uh, to do mass media campaigns. And unfortunately today, um, the ecosystem is so scattered. Um, I think you know the most effective way often is when a major platform, kind of like COVID-19, is able to label or put something up um, up front that all users um, have to see. Um, and but but it's very very difficult to to do media literacy without a ton of money. And that's the unfortunate reality of being able to transform behavior. And um, you know, the question is who would do that and who is that source of truth? Um, and I think those are really, really difficult. Um, in, in other countries that have experimented for this, um, you know, I think it's really hard, again, like Nora mentioned, to measure what is effective and what isn't. So um, it, I think it needs to be done. Um, I think it needs to be also very specific on what context, right? So if it's media literacy around voting and elections, <laughs> how do you find the way, the, the types of um, vehicles to be able to deliver that message um, in a targeted way? Um, and so you're not necessarily uh, looking at having to advertise then to everyone, but to a bottleneck of, of a set few people that are most likely to create the most um, damage if, if they decide to share something that is mm -hmm. untrue. Well, let's bring this to, you know, the issue that we're all dealing with. We're all talking about COVID-19. Hey, and let's bring in Gwyneth Paltrow, why don't we, right? So we know, we <laughs> oh, know no. uh, that she, uh, no. that Gwyneth, I'm, I'm uh, really unaware of whatever's going on. Did uh, but I'll, I'll make you aware, Nora. Uh, so, so this is actually a thorny thorny issue, as you mentioned uh, in your, your intro, of dealing with, with thorny tech problems. So here is one. Uh, Gwyneth Paltrow, and similar to a lot of influencers, uh, early on, a few weeks ago, uh, had been pushing out the use of um, wearing a mask, right? Mm -hmm. Wearing a mask in public. 
However, this did go against uh, general uh, scientific consensus uh, from a lot of the major organizations that we were citing as uh, the, the ones who would have the, the, the best up-to-date data. Uh, how do you think we would deal with something like that? Because on one hand, you could imagine platforms saying, and there were a lot of articles on this, that influential people like Gwen Paltrow could present a danger because people would be buying up masks that don't go to healthcare workers. Whereas now, uh, today when we're speaking on April 9th, uh, we seem to have changed the consensus around wearing masks in public. So I, I present that because that's a thorny issue. Whereas uh, what seemed to be wrong information two weeks ago is now in hindsight, because of how quickly this issue is moving, is now seen as correct information. So do we do we ban Gwyneth Paltrow? That's, that's basically what I'm asking. <laughs> because that, that's legitimately an issue that they were, they're dealing with, right? You have influencers that are affecting people's behavior from the information that they are conveying and, and Gwyneth Paltrow being one of them. Um, I, I will just, you know, start off by saying a lot of platforms today have different policies. Uh, they allow for those that are considered public figures. So this could be politicians. Sometimes it can include celebrities. Um, I think Gwyneth would probably fall under that category in which um, there is a little bit more um, around, you know, how far content and information someone says um, can actually reach. And that's also why a lot of companies have enacted blue check marks or other systems in the background to really think about influencers in a very different way because um, there is so much more amplification that happens when they accidentally share something um, or say something and then, you know, that could be potentially damaging. In your case of what you just described as the example of masks, I think um, it, it's a debate. I mean, I think there's still a lot of questions around people being confused. The CDC for a long time was asking people not to wear masks, not because you shouldn't, but because of a supply chain issue right. of yeah. not having enough masks for frontline medical workers. I think you know, a lot of the problems around whether to wear masks or not really comes from the lack of detailed transparency of why you shouldn't be doing something. Um, and a lot and a lot of the headlines have been just around wear a mask or don't. Um, Nora, I don't know if you know, you're about to jump yeah. in. Well, um, I honestly, uh, I'm going to sound, I swear I'm not getting paid, but of course I am getting paid to talk about media literacy. We are not sponsored by Goop. There we go. This I'm is not sponsored, out there. No. not sponsored by Goop, though I would be open to that. Uh, you know, um, honestly, I would say that this is truly one of the um, sort of openings to talk about why media literacy skills matter and mm -hmm. that an influencer, whatever they are posting, whoever they are, should really actually be treated no differently when you, the user, are online than anyone else. I don't have a blue check mark. You know, if I'm saying something that is me just tweeting about it, um, that should be treated if you are someone else looking at it, the same as Gwyneth's post about masks. And ultimately, I think the question becomes, why am I seeing this? What is this making me feel? You know, can I verify it? Now, in the COVID-19 context, there is certainly this sort of like frenzy that everyone is playing into. And I mean all of us. Um, an example are those videos um, that have been edited. Germany was one that showed this. It went viral. Um, there have been some in the U.S. of um, like grocery store shopping images and videos where people appear to be grabbing at food to try to get, you know, stock up before the apocalypse. Um, in Germany, when those videos went viral on WhatsApp, um, it ended up being, it, they proved that it was from, I think, 2013, those videos were taken and they were spliced together to mm. make it seem like right now there is this potential lack of food supply and other supply um, to drain people. You know, that's really, it seemed like what the intent was. And I always urge people now, like in our media literacy trainings, to think about, well, why am I seeing this? Um, and I would apply the same question or encourage people to apply it when they're looking at Gwyneth Paltrow's tweet. You know, is this actually credible information? Is, is she reporting right now? Like, has she verified that? And if I'm going to share Gwyneth's post about wearing face masks, have I been able to spend the time to verify what she posted? Maybe it's just her comment and I, that's great. She has every right to do that. But we then, each of us, if we're becoming publishers, which I think we are right now yeah. in our own right, we have the responsibility to 
um, do our own due diligence. And I don't think uh, maybe you wanted my answer to be that, yes, we should remove goop. Uh, <laughs> but I, I didn't buy into it, David. You no, know, well, I, don't. <laughs> I, I know we can, we can talk about this uh, at length, but we are kind of nearing the end. So I do want to thank uh, Nora and Clara for, for coming on today. Could you just tell everybody uh, where they can connect with you on the on the interwebs if they want to continue the conversation? Sure, you can connect with me everywhere. Um, <laughs> on Twitter, I am uh, at Attorney Nora, which is easy. And then on LinkedIn, Nora Benavides. And um, at PEN America, we're doing workshops on media literacy all the time. I have one on Monday. Um, anyone is welcome. They are free. And they're they're not even very boring. So there you go. I like it. Clara. You're muted. Oh, I, I you can look below. Um, my my oh, handle good. is Tweet Clarita. Um, and then um, you can just find me on LinkedIn. Um, just slip into my DMs and I will respond. <laughs> <laughs> well, slip into your DMs. Great. So I want to thank everybody for, for tuning in, especially those that told me my uh, my sound was a little lower. Hey, we're saying that the world is filled with trolls, but um, I got to tell you, our feed is filled with the best and brightest of the of the interweb. So thank you. Uh, you can connect with me. I'm at Tech Ethicist. Uh, my name is David Ryan Polgar. If I didn't mention that, in the beginning. Uh, and then please, uh, please get in touch with us at alltechishuman.org and our partner organization, The Bridge, which is thebridgework.com. So thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you.